Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome, welcome to St. John's. This is the place where grace abounds. Grace abounds for us on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, we had the announcements up on the screen, but of course I'll just highlight a few. We do have a sign-up sheet for volunteers uh, on the Narthex table for BBS 2024 coming August 19th through the 23rd. 6 to 8 p.m. Please spread the word on registration. Registration forms are available also on the back Narthex table and on our website. You can download an editable, uh, not edible, but editable uh, document, Word document and PDF. So all that's on our website. Um, we also uh, have no Wednesday night worship this Wednesday. Uh, I'm still going to be catching up on sleep. So I think that's a, a good call, at least for this Wednesday. Um, but uh, God is good, and uh, all things are going well. And uh, caffeine is also a good gift from God. Uh, I think that's it for, for announcements. Uh, I'll leave the rest to you on that. Everything you need to know for the service is in the bulletin or up on the screen. Uh, our gospel text today is the death of John the Baptist. What God is saying to us through that, that we have um, preachers, uh, you know, and this is true of us as well, not only myself, but as we are sent out into the world as, as preachers bearing God's word, we bear both the law and the gospel, and the law is a word that often gets silenced uh, because it is true. But it is meant, as God has given it to us, to kill the sinner. And to raise us then with the other word, which is the word of the gospel. The final word. The word of promise that our sins are forgiven. We are here to hear that word, both words again, this morning. And to leave in the clear forgiveness of our sins with a clear conscience. Let us begin our service with prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this morning. And again, for gathering your people into this place to receive these words, we ask that through the law that you would kill us and bring the sinner to death, raise us to new life with the promise of the forgiveness of our sins we, uh, as a new creature, a new person that has faith and trust in you and what your son has done for us in and through his death and resurrection. Send us your spirit and guide us in all truth. And may we leave with peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for our opening first three verses of Crown Him with Many Crowns.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. We'll if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore we are here. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins. And lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, you are favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sins. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, of our salvation. And put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that every people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely the salvation is Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and make his footsteps away.
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, amid earthly strife among nations, governments, and peoples within their own lands, remind us through your word and spirit that your kingdom is not of this world. That as we face troubles in this life, we trust in the truth that through Christ's death and resurrection, you have overcome the world. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings of God's Word. Good morning. Okay. The Old Testament reading today is from Amos chapter 7, 7 to 15. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the, lad, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never pass, I, I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. And we're going to read the epistle. The epistle today is from Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 14. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand.
Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oath and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated for the hymn of the day.
dear friends in Christ, what do you do when the law invades your conscience? We'll get in there at some point, because God will speak it, and it will say something to you. It will reveal something about you, and what it says to you is true. So what do you do when the law is spoken to you and you stand accused? And what do you do with the person who spoke that word to you? These are the questions from our gospel text from Mark. The law had invaded King Herod's conscience and also Herodias' conscience. And they tried to deal with it the only way that they knew how. And it's what we do too. Nevertheless, God has brought you here this morning because he has a word for you. He can actually silence the accusation of the law and clear your conscience. So our gospel reading begins at verse 14 and says, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. First we have to ask, what is it? <laughs> We're kind of breaking into the story. Um, what is it that King Herod heard of? Well, this text follows immediately after last week's gospel text from Mark. Um, and so we go to the very end of last week's reading um, where it says, And he, Jesus, called the twelve, and he began to send them out two by two. Remember this? He's sending out his disciples with the authority over the unclean spirits. And the very end it says, so they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. King Herod had heard of these mighty works being done by the twelve because, well, these mighty works were actually being done by the twelve. Jesus had given them authority to do these things. And that's why it says King Herod Heard of it for Jesus' name and become known. Jesus is the one who sent them. Jesus is the one who has the power to do this, who has the authority, and he had given these 12 the power to do these mighty works. But this news worried Herod. I mean, you think this would be good news, right? People are getting healed, and unclean spirits are being cast out, sins are being forgiven. This is great. Not for Herod. Because as it turned out, King Herod had a guilty conscience. What had he done? King Herod had John the Baptist beheaded. And there's a lot of context here as we begin our gospel text. These things had already taken place. And now Mark is filling in the backstory for us. First, uh, we've got to mention that Herod is a king. Well, he's, he's kind of a king. He's kind of like a, a he's a tetrarch. He's sort of like a, a fourth of a king or something like that. He has some power. Uh, he has his own little section to rule over. But we do need to say that he has power. And we need to also say that he has God-given power. And we say that because no one is in authority in this world outside of God's choosing. That's a tough pill to swallow. Kings and rulers make and administer law, right? This is what they've been given to do. God gives them this authority. No matter how well they do it, no matter how great they do it, or, or anywhere in between, God has given them this authority. So um, we're even going to go so far as to say that Herod is the law incarnate. Herod is even the law incarnate. And note here that King Herod is administering a law in, in our gospel text within the context of the fifth commandment. It's an inescapable one. Capital punishment. It's an inescapable reality for a ruler. But Herod... Uh, as the law incarnate as the king, he could not just put John the Baptist to death. That wasn't given to him to do. There had to be an opportunity for it to be done lawfully. 
That opportunity, as we read, came on Herod's birthday when Herodias' daughter, you read that right, his, his wife's daughter came in and danced for him and his guests. I will leave that up to uh, your interpretation of what that means. It's much worse than just dance. Uh, the guests at this party are the swamp pond, if you will. Herodias had wanted John dead, we read, because he had said that her and Herod's marriage was sinful. It's not lawful for you to take your brother's wife. Herodias was his brother's wife, but he took her as his own. We have a word for this, uh, and it's one of the more egregious violations of the Sixth Commandment. And of course, that's not disturbing enough. You have Herodias' daughter. Now, Herod's daughter, right, by marriage, had excited him to the point where he made a vow to her, an oath to her. A vow that as king, as the law incarnate, he could not back out of. He had sworn this oath. He had to do it. So John's head ended up on a platter. Because he was the voice that spoke the law that went straight up into the consciences of both Herod and Herodias. When it gets there, when the accusation of the law gets there, when it lives there, what does it do? Well, it, it accuses, but it attacks. Right? The law attacks you. Uh, of course, when we say the, the law kills the sinner, yes, it is, it is doing a, a pretty uh, a forceful attack on you. It creates fear. It creates unrest. Because what it says is, is true. And Mark uses a great word that helps us understand what it does. I want you to catch this. Uh, he wrote, and Herodias had a grudge. Herodias had a grudge against John the Baptist and wanted to put him to death. That's the word we're going to hang on. The, the person who has the law in their conscience has a grudge against it. Right? Well... It's, it's like self-defense. It attacks you, and what do you want to do? You want to attack back. It's accused you. You want to accuse back. This is the law trying to get rid of the law. You're using the attack of the law to get back at the law, hopefully, hope, hoping that it will silence the law and what it has said to you. But there's a problem with that. You can't get back at the law because what the law is saying to you is true. And your core, you know that. That's why it's stuck in your conscience. That's why it's stuck in Herod and Herodias' conscience. It was wrong of them to marry. But you have to attack, right? So you can't attack the law, so where does the attack go? To the preacher. <laughs> to the one who spoke that word. You might say it, it can't go vertical, it has to go sideways. That's why this story uh, follows the sending of the twelve. Jesus had just sent out the twelve and immediately we find um, that preachers end up with their heads on a platter. This is John the Baptist's end, who is the, you might say, the, the last of the prophets, the first of the, the preachers. And it's going to happen to the twelve as well in various ways. In fact, all preachers of God's word will end up <laughs> with their heads on a platter. Think about our culture today and the concept that uh, words equal violence. Have you heard this before? Words equal Violence. It's no coincidence that you hear this around violations, especially against the fifth and sixth commandments. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. I mean, we want to be our own gods. We're selfish. We want to do what we want. We have a warped, sinful nature that has warped, sinful Desires, passions, going against God's good designs and gifts. And 
we disregard his word to define ourselves. And we want to define ourselves by what we do or what we feel. We want to take control of our lives and again be our own gods. But you can't help it. The law will be spoken to you. Truth exists and it will be spoken to you. And this is why the culture says that words equal violence. Because the law attacks. It attacks the sinner. It accuses the sinner. It kills the sinner. And so there's a need to fight back. I've been attacked. I'm going to fight back at it. This is Herodias's grudge. But you can't cancel the law. You can't attack the law because what it says is true. So where does the attack go? To the preacher. It goes to the one they recognize as the voice that they're hearing in their conscience telling them that what they're doing, what they're desiring, what they're feeling, what they're pursuing, saying, and thinking is sin. So words get banned. You're not allowed to say certain phrases. You need to use safe words and have safe places. People get canceled. It's a culture of acceptance over absolution. This is the law trying to silence the law. And don't think that you don't do this too. Don't think that you are apart from those who sin against the fifth and sixth commandments. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And then whoever murders will be liable to judgment. And you might be thinking, I'm not one of those. But Jesus says, I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Ever been angry before at someone? Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. And then Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It's all well and good to accuse others of sin, to be the, the, the wielder of the law to the culture. But what happens when the law accuses you? What is Jesus doing? He's condemning the whole lot. You and me included. You have sinned. You fall short of the glory of God. You are the murderer and the adulterer. They're not out there somewhere. That's you. And maybe now you want to put my head on a platter. You might do your best to ignore it, to silence the one speaking the law, or to lessen its accusation with acceptance. Anything to get that law out of your conscience. But it won't work. It never works. It can't work because you can't use the law to end the law. Nevertheless, we do it and we try, and it will always fail. It didn't work for Herod. It didn't work for Herodias either. John was beheaded. Right? Mission accomplished. We silenced the preacher who was saying these things against us. But did that put away the grudge? Did that silence the accusation of the law for Herod who took his brother's wife and married her? Did it kick the law out of his conscience or, or Herodias' conscience? No. Notice how terrified Herod is when he heard, hears of these mighty works being done. This is good news, but not to Herod. He says, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. The sinner is always scared of resurrection. John is back, and what's he going to do? He's going to keep accusing me. He's going to keep speaking that law. It's going to keep going into my conscience. I can't get rid of that voice. John didn't speak only the law. Mark tells us that when Herod heard him speak, he was greatly perplexed, yet he heard him gladly. Because something other than the law was being preached, and certainly some other kind of power was being used to accomplish these mighty works of healing, freeing, and raising. Herod can't 
put a word to it. He doesn't know what it is, but we can. That other word is in fact the only thing that can actually clear the conscience, that can actually silence the accusation of the law. And it won't come by avoiding, it won't come by acceptance, it won't come by beheading every preacher who speaks God's word to you. And no matter how many preachers the world or even congregations get rid of, Jesus will keep sending more to preach not only the law, but the promise of the gospel. Friends, Jesus has sworn a vow to you according to a promise, and it will not, it cannot be broken. The head of the ancient enemy, the serpent, is served up on a platter. He has been crushed. And your sins, including all of your sins in your body and mind against the fifth and sixth commandments, they were all placed on Jesus in his body and nailed to the cross. He defeated them in his death, all of them. And he put away all of them in his resurrection. Now your sins are forgiven. This is Jesus' promise to you. This is his vow, his oath to you. Your sins are forgiven. You have absolution instead of acceptance. And the law has nothing more to say to you. The complete Complete and total forgiveness of your sins is yours in Jesus' name. This also means that the grave is not your end. The resurrection is now good news to you. For you have been forgiven and will be raised with Jesus on the last day. Even as you, view, even as you have been raised right now to new life in the hearing of his promise. Jesus has sworn this oath to you. And he will keep it just as certain as he has made sure that you are hearing it this morning. And so you get to leave this place today, dear friends, not like Herod, not like Herodias, not seeking to use the law against the law. Friends, you get to leave with a clear conscience, with peace that can only come from sins forgiven. Thanks be to God. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. And let us confess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. And was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Lord, we are citizens of the nations and places in which you have put us, with our citizenship in heaven assured. In our land, guide and direct the governing authorities over us, that they may serve according to your will. Impart in them your truth and wisdom, that life be treasured and protected, justice enacted and order kept secure. Grant your protection over those who serve in the military, both here and abroad, 
and safety to all who keep roads and communities safe in their law enforcement vocation. Amid the conflicts and tribulations in any land, instill in us responsible citizenship as we await the eternal kingdom, not of this world. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In these summer months, grant favorable weather and safe travel for all who give thanks for your creation. In each and every season, continue to pour out your mercy and grace that we as your people remain faithful and trusting in your promises made, fulfilled, and yet to come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For all who face troubles and trials in life, in mind, body, or soul, give your peace and comfort in times of affliction. We especially lift up to you today Jane Wicks, Barbara and Lenny Stanisic, Eva Porte, Ken Borchers, Dick and Janice for Bones, Donald Wicks Jr., Trustin DeVoe, Anita Heaton, Allison, Janine, Marilyn Stone, Bill Miller, Jerry Radice, Bill Lomeller, Stuart Hilton, Sherry Hirsch, Bentley Kelly, John Seiler, the family and friends of Janice Corradetti, family and friends of Max Weber. We also give you thanks for Thea Marie and all those we name in our hearts. For those who have gone before us in the faith, we give you thanks for their witness of truth and hope. Comfort those who grieve. In all things, grant us your spirit to sustain us in our earthly pilgrimage. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We lift, up to you to the, we lift up to you the authorities over us in our synod, districts, and congregations. Grant wisdom and confidence for all who lead. Bless all churches and people of all ages that you gather together as your own we may be courageous witnesses of your grace and truth to our neighbors, communities, and beyond. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom is not of this world, yet you come to us still in your word and sacraments to strengthen us, nourish us, and forgive our sins. Bless our unity and fellowship at your table as we receive Jesus in his body and blood until the eternal feast you have prepared for those who keep faith in you. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, we have peace with God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us share that peace now with one another. May be seated as we continue with our offering.
right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who through the blood of Christ has given us an inheritance that will never spoil or fade and a kingdom that lasts forever. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... Receive your Son's true body and blood given and shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Give us your Holy Spirit so that we believe your Holy Word and live as members of your gracious kingdom here in time. And finally, by your mercy, be brought to live as partakers of your everlasting reign. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
Gracious Lord, as your kingdom comes through bread and wine, the body and blood of our Savior, we give you thanks for refreshing us through this gift. As you give us a foretaste of the feast to come in your everlasting kingdom and the inheritance given to us as your adopted children, strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And as we receive the blessing of our Lord, we place our hands out in front of us like a cup. This is our posture, our position before God. We come with nothing to give, nothing to offer, and everything to receive. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. And we continue with our closing hymn.